calculating or interpreting the position without being uh, massively brilliant. Okay, now we see that uh, we're attacking uh, all of these weaknesses. We could open lines at one point. We could bring the queen into the attack. Uh, you know, white has the initiative and black is going to have to defend uh, correctly. Now, being brilliant, there's actually a much better move here and that's rook takes f6. Because after pawn takes f6, then white plays queen takes h6 and there is absolutely no way to parry with the threat of knight to h5 because that's just the end of the game. If bishop to g4, then rook to f4 and um, white will win this game in less than five or six moves. Notice that we don't even have to capture the bishop. We're threatening h3 and rook to h4. So this position is uh, collapsing for black. Also pay attention to something here and that's that notice that the rook is not in the game and that there is no counterplay that uh, black could stir up in this position. I mean he's just he's completely lost. Okay so let's continue with the game. Uh, okay so rook a to f1 and that's right the sacrifices on f6 actually do work there. Okay, so white played a3. Um, black played knight to g6. One second. Actually, black did not play knight to g6. He played c5. And after rook a to f1, he played pawn takes pawn. And now the idea is if rook takes f6, then white, black has the opportunity of playing pawn takes c3. And uh, this is threatening to capture the rook because if pawn takes, then pawn takes. And after queen to h6 and just queen c5 check followed by queen to g5. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, apparently white saw that and they played pawn takes pawn. And now black plays knight to g6. Okay. Now, in this position, if I were white, I would already be thinking about how to break through in the position. Why? All of my pieces are developed. The rooks are singing a tune uh, on the F file. The bishop is developed attacking the king side. The knight is getting ready to menace uh, also the king side. I would be thinking about how to break through in the position. White played a very curious move here. He played d5. Now, intuitively, the first move that comes to my mind, and it's the move that I saw, which is why I show it, is e5. Try to see if you could um, interpret the move. After pawn takes e5, what's the idea? The idea is that white has this tactical shot, d5. Notice the rook on a, how it's still not developed. The rook should actually be in d8, and he should be threatening to capture that pawn right now. Bishop takes d5, bishop g6. And after pawn takes bishop, queen takes d5 check. Not only is white up material, but he's also <laughs> uh, completely crushing black positionally. Okay, so that's winning. And if rook a to d8, threatening bishop takes g2, the Desperado, um, then white has the luxury of playing the brilliant queen takes d5, not because he's sacrificing the queen, but because he's gaining complete control of uh, all the white squares in the board. Rook takes d5, bishop takes f2 check, king h8, bishop takes e d5, and now 
not only do we have three pieces for the queen, but we also have complete control of all the white squares. This position should collapse in seven or eight moves for black. So how could white miss that? We don't know. It's a big mystery. And that's kind of, I think it's very instructive for you to see that, to see what I would be thinking there, how it's time to break through. And now you're going to see the mistake. White plays d5. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to interpret this move as to what black or white could have been thinking in the game and, uh, and also why it's a bad move. Okay. The pawns are like sacred. Pushing a pawn is, you know, everything you've heard about it, it's true. You know, you can't push the pawn, you know, pawns don't move backwards. It takes time to, to, to play, uh, to move a pawn. And uh, time is very essential here in this position. When white pushes d5, we make, you know, we sin in a very, you know, just not good because the e5 square uh, is weakened and there will never be a pawn to keep pieces away from that square. And what that means for for uh, for black is that now he can start fighting back in the game. And uh, you're going to see how, you know, it's because of the e5 square, all the pieces uh, basically, you know, black survives and he ends up winning this game. Okay, so um, we're looking at this more from a, a very instructive perspective rather than appraising Nimzovich, you know, his, the superiority uh, in this game. Okay, so knight g6, d5, Nimzovich played bishop to d7, brilliant move, understood what was going on. Had he played bishop to d7, uh, white would have uh, would have had the tactical shot rook takes f6 after pawn takes knight to h5 and we have uh, and white's attack is winning because the threat is to go queen takes h6 and there's no way to stop checkmate either on g7 or by knight takes f6 checkmate of the knight once the queen is on h6 and so let's say a very a sample line would be um let's see okay if uh if king h7 the knight takes f6 check king g7 knight h5 check followed by uh, e5 here. And this is just complete breakthrough. Um, this is, the attack is winning for white. Okay, so Nimzovich played bishop to g4. Now white played another three triple question mark move. Uh, he played rook to c1. And uh, the reason why I would label this a, a three question mark move is because uh, it's based on, you know, basic after rook to c1, the pieces all, you know, we went from playing on the king side to playing on the queen side. And uh, you could be the judge as to how much that would make sense. Rook A to C8. Rook F to F1, another very, uh, very aggressive move, Rook F to F1. Now black plays queen to E5. Notice how black uses the E5 square to improve his pieces. Queen to F2. Threatening to capture the pawn, a6, h3, and this is the last of the three question mark moves. Why? There are times in chess 
when we make a move like bishop to g4 to cause a weakness in the position to to uh to try to entice your opponent to make a move like h3 okay here the bishop is doing absolutely nothing on g4 when we play h3 we reroute our bishop to another square where uh, seemingly it has hope of doing something in the near future and then we're left with what the pawn move created and what was that less control of the g3 square which uh, results in more weaknesses in the black squares around the king and also we have uh, the target on h3 okay let's see how the game continues rook f to d1 black plays queen to g5 with tempo threatening the rook rook takes c8 rook takes now let's try to take stock of the pieces and by that i mean let's compare piece by piece who's better black is completely better with every single piece notice that our knight uh, is better than his because we have more potential especially the e5 square our bishop is better than the bishop on d3 it's more aggressive not only do we have the option of exchanging bishops but we're also threatening a capture the queen is more aggressively placed than the queen on f2 the rook is where it's supposed to be in the open file uh, and even our king is safer than the, than the white king so black black is literally winning in this position king to h2 now uh, black uses the e5 square knight to e5 knight to f5 threatening knight e7 check and now um, rook to c8 I mean c1 notice that if rook takes rook the knight takes bishop wins a piece so that's not good rook to c1 rook to d2 and here we see uh, whites I mean blacks complete victory uh, his triumph of strategy which is g6 if I were to play a move in a, in a, in a chess game g6 like g6 uh, I'd feel real happy because I know that this is the point where uh, every, everything is already just falling apart for for white notice that he starts moving back knight to e3 and now the culmination of, uh, of all those small advantages black plays bishop takes h3 if pawn takes how would black win there knight f3 check queen takes queen to g1 checkmate And if king takes, then simply rook to h1 checkmate. Okay, so after bishop takes h3, white chose to play bishop to, to f1. And here, Nimzovich played bishop d7. Let me just go ahead and mention uh, the, the other opportunity that he had. And I doubt that he missed this. I think he played bishop d7 because... He wants to keep all of the attack on white's king in a position like this if you're playing a game and maybe this is this is a tip that uh you know you might not read in a thousand and one chess combinations <laughs> or in uh you know how to beat the the petrov uh when you're attacking and you have the ability to win an exchange or to win a pawn but you're you know this comes uh, at a price of basically you know you have your, your by exchanging pieces you know sometimes it's better to keep all of this chaos in the position because it's gonna end up winning the game for you and I've done this numerous of times instead of winning a pawn 
I keep on improving the positioning of my pieces and my opponent's position just completely collapses. So after bishop d7, he's threatening queen takes g5, I mean queen takes e3, followed by knight to g4 check, and knight takes c3. Uh, I think he's also threatening rook takes f1, followed by knight g4 check and knight takes queen. Okay, so um, bishop d7, king g1. The game is over. Bishop b5. Now the threat is to go queen takes c3. Followed by rook takes f1 check. King h2. Knight g4 check. And knight takes queen. Uh, the player of the white pieces played rook to d1. And black very quickly concluded the game with queen takes knight. Queen takes queen. Rook takes queen to b6 did he play queen to b6 here no excuse me g3 wait rook takes c1 i'm sorry queen b6 knight to g4 he's threatening checkmate in one move i apologize g3 Bishop takes f1, brilliant, threatening checkmate, and white resigned. Notice that if queen to b3, threatening the rook, all white has to do is play rook to a1, and there's no uh, logical way of preventing bishop to h3, checkmate. So uh, this game is a beautiful illustration of how... Um, of how black won, uh, how names of which won by uh, just being a more refined player as opposed to, you know, his superiority in uh, in strength. Uh, he had an inferior position, a very passive position, but all white did was play those compulsive pawn moves that didn't lead to anything conclusive, and unfortunately, he ended up losing the game. I'm sure I could have chosen one of the uh, many classical examples, but I decided to uh, personalize the lecture by, you know, showing or explaining uh, what, you know, one of Nimzovich's uh, theories that influenced my game uh, tremendously, which was that, you know, we should, that pawn moves are not developing moves and that, uh, and that we should develop our pieces as opposed to our pawns. Uh, that's all for today's lecture, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.